Welcome to episode 3 of Villains Too Stupid to Win. Surprise surprise, it's another evil megacorp obsessed with activities that will probably wipe out their customer base. What the hell is up with these guys? One of the first examples of the classic dystopian trope. It's the Wayland yutani Corporation from the Alien franchise. First seen in Alien, a claustrophobic sci-fi monster movie but also a scathing critique of labour exploitation that ironically makes the unionist heroes of this theme come off like a couple of lazy entitled jerks. Look, I'm not gonna do any more work, we get this straightened out. Then it kills them off just as they're starting the revolution and leaves the remaining bourgeoisie supporting flight crew class to try to save the day but definitely not seize the means. And speaking of that, dear viewers, make sure you seize yourself a download of Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, we have a video sponsor. It's a turn-based RPG game featuring slick 3D graphics and it comes absolutely jam-packed with features and upgrade options. This game is heaps of fun and it's well suited to mobile play. With an impressive story mode, tournaments, unique missions and challenges, and perhaps most importantly, epic boss battles. There's even a PvP battle arena if you feel like slogging it out with other players. Unlock new champions and level up your favoured warriors through combat or by sacrificing the weak for the cause. That's pretty brutal. Upgrade artifacts, tinker around with endless character builds and construct a perfectly balanced team to smite your enemies. There are hundreds of champions to collect from 16 playable factions, all with unique abilities and attributes. But the best part about this game, it's free to play. With Battle Pass Season 1 now live, you'll win a dizzying array of rewards including new epic and legendary champions, just for completing daily and weekly challenges. Seriously, these guys are adding new features all the time. So come join me and millions of players worldwide. You can find me under Gamer ID Zealot Smash, and if you're quick, you can also join my clan, Cult of Kilnassus. Raid Shadow Legends is available from Google Play and the Apple Store. You can even download it on your PC. But today, we have a limited 30 day offer for new players. Just head down to the video description, click on the link, and you'll receive 100,000 silver and one free champion. Hex Weaver. This is a powerful champion that will give you a great head start in the game. All this free stuff will be waiting for you right here. So get in quick, click that link in the video description and seize yourself a download of Raid Shadow Legends. The main curator of the Alien canon, legendary director slash flip flopper Ridley Scott, nowadays seems to spend most of his production time trying to decide whether his latest movie should be shoehorned into the Alien franchise. After years of fans praying to the Xenomorph gods, Ridley finally heeded the call by forcibly impregnating a bunch of wafty existential themes into a series built on the back of a terrifying relentless space monster, when all we really needed to get our goo flowing was a good old fashioned alien flick. And thus, with a few proclamations from on high, Lord Ridley, patron saint of dystopian sci-fi universes, banished the AVP franchise from the canonical order and attempted to cram the Blade Runner universe in its place. He smited away the mysterious origins of the Xenomorph, gunked up by an android and a few fresh batches of engineer goo. Though I guess we should be thankful to be rid of at least two confusing Lance Henriksen characters. This level of tinkering won't help all that much. Because in the years since the original Alien, an assortment of other directors, screenwriters, producers, authors, and game developers have made their own interpretations. Apparently with the collective goal of confusing the shit out of everyone. And yet you fully intend to continue investigating. Oh, you thought Corporal Hicks died at the start of Alien 3? Actually nah, of course he survived, only NPCs think otherwise. Innocent Newt is definitely dead though, she's still gone. Nobody goes home! You mean you actually believed the power loader was a caterpillar invention? Psh, that's a Wayland patent now. 
and let me introduce you to a simple character called Michael Bishop. Though he is credited as Bishop 2, seen on Furina at the end of Alien 3. He may or may not be the designer of the Bishop Android series and is supposedly the same person as this guy from Aliens Colonial Marines. Though in the game he's now called Michael Wayland and he may or may not be a legitimate Wayland. Someone is obviously lying. Then, shock twist, it turns out he was an android for the entire game. Though not the android called Bishop we see earlier and none of them are the original Bishop we knew in Aliens. Oh yeah, sure! Though supposedly this Michael Bishop Wayland guy is indeed a real person who was hanging around at some point, eventually appearing on Furina now under the name Michael Bishop. But according to some, that guy might be an android too. A red-blooded one. Is everyone clear on this? It's safe to say the Alien universe is a bit of an awesome mess. Full of inconsistencies, half-baked retcons, an obscene level of badassery, and a gaping abyss worth of room for interpretation. Arguably. And that's just the main story. It's less canon, more musket. So yeah, I'll give it my best shot. It all began with Wayland Corp, who like Umbrella, were actually pretty benevolent when they started out. Founded by Peter Wayland, he made his first billion from solar energy, then single-handedly solved climate change, cured cancer, developed the first faster-than-light ships, the first androids, and spearheaded the quest for extrasolar planetary colonization. What a guy. Almost like an Elon Musk who doesn't fear AI and never wasted his time dropping dance tracks. Until Wayland hit old age and developed an unhealthy obsession with immortality, just like billionaire sicko. Peter Thiel. So obviously, that's when things started getting seriously icky. Eventually, Wayland Industries merged with a tech competitor called Utani Corp, of which not much is known. That is, assuming we obey Ridley's commandment, thou shalt ignore the AVP franchise. So that means in Ridley's Prime Universe, a presumably innocent Japanese person's name has been dragged through the mud for over a century by a corporation that is run almost exclusively by nefarious white dudes. In the years of the original Alien trilogy, Wayland Utani are the most powerful corporation in existence, and for all intents and purposes lords of their own interstellar empire. They have extensive assets in interplanetary shipping and transport, and are the leading manufacturer of technology, including synthetics, weaponry, atmospheric processing tech, faster than light ships, and apparently kids tricycles. They also operate human planetary colonies through the Extra Solar Colonization Administration and employ their own private army. Not to mention they have the US Colonial Marines at their beck and call. They appear to hold massive influence over whatever pathetic state powers remain, who offer them minimal oversight. And as you'll soon find out, Wayland Utani isn't a company you want to leave to self-regulate because the Xenomorphs and the confusing canon aren't the only monsters of this franchise. No, there's another. It's... it's the corporation. Just making sure you got that. Point 1. A factional, disorganized Wayland yutani sends woefully prepared teams on important missions. They also place rebel agitators in positions where they can work against the company's goals. Wayland Utani has a long and checkered history of doing everything in their power to acquire aliens, except to give their employees the proper equipment, information, and training to actually do so. And stranger still, they often give key roles to people who offer little in the way of operational value, but will quite obviously be ideologically opposed to the hidden goals of the corporation. Yep, Wayland Utani has a disturbing trend of sabotaging their missions in the planning stage. However, there is one thing Wayland Utani does excel at, and that's being a shadowy corporation. Some of the powerful people who are ultimately responsible for these missions and the subsequent mistakes have manipulated the situation so they remain completely anonymous 
far removed from the front line, so I'm afraid that for half of this video, I'm basically going to be yelling at clouds. Things kick off way back in 2093, and since Wayland Industries appears to be the dominant party of the corporate merger, we'll be looking at their transgressions too. It's the first time the corporation threatens the existence of the human race, when a disturbingly shriveled looking Peter Wayland expends a massive amount of company resources on a selfish mission to LV223. He intends to demand his creators do something about this annoying aging thing, but this agenda is his hidden from the rest of the crew, who are not only ignorant of Wayland's true plan, but aren't even told there could be scary aliens around until they're already there. Woo. This revelation would be a massive psychological hit to the best of us, but unfortunately for the mission, recruitment seems to suck at their job, because most of these employees aren't just out of their depth, they're also just plain terrible. Do you have anything to back that up? Before they even manage to land, we've got a first and medical officer, Ford, who believes that a 3% atmospheric CO2 level is toxic enough to kill someone in a few minutes. CO2 is over 3%. Two minutes without a suit, you're dead. When in reality, humans can survive much longer at that level. So after sitting down on an alien planet, with an atmosphere conducive to life, and entering a facility that was quite obviously designed by an intelligent alien species, these idiots take off their helmets as soon as they detect a breathable atmosphere within. As if spacesuits are only good for air supply and not also protecting oneself from hostile alien pathogens and the like. The fact that this breathable atmosphere was created by alien technology would make me a tad concerned about what else could be floating around. Smells fine to me. Our doomed crew find a dead engineer, and despite coming in here knowing they were looking for aliens, it's enough to make half our supposed scientists lose their shit immediately. Dead body arena! This cowardly biologist, who also had no problem taking his helmet off in a filthy, goose-spattered alien environment, freaks out and bails after seeing this thing, foregoing his potential Nobel Prize. No, ship's good. Yeah, ship very good. Convinced to leave by this belligerent crust-punk Fifield. I like rocks. I love rocks. A geologist with a head full of rocks, who literally just mapped this facility. So of course, he leads them back to their ship easily. Oh wait, nope, they're going further in. Lost and cut off, now content to hang for a bit in a room chock full of dead aliens. Milburn, who not long ago was terrified of a dead alien, rightfully warns against touching a big pile of them. Don't touch, okay? and freaks a bit more when he learns there might be a life form around. That's consistent. Glitch, man. Pings, glitch, life form. What the f But then, a few minutes later, he's all about getting close and personal with a living alien creature. Look at you. Look at you, baby. Which looks like a hybrid of male and female genitalia with some concerning serpentine characteristics thrown in. Stop your grinning and drop your linen. I'm shielding my orifices just looking at this thing. I'll do the fingering. The rest of the crew are middling at best. Not the stupidest people ever, but still willing to let an obvious biohazard back onto their only ship. Thankfully Vickers is smart enough to put a stop to this. We are in a crisis situation and we will follow procedure. The estranged daughter of Peter Whelan, she's the only one with some clout who actually seems to know the true mission. Though she had her authority seriously undermined from the outset. As far as you're concerned, they're both in charge. Yeah, great. Thanks, Pete. Let's put some people in charge who don't even know what the real mission is. These two, though probably the most qualified for an alien encounter, are supposedly just here because Wayland wanted some true believers along for the ride. Wayland was a superstitious man. He wanted a true believer on board. But their approach to contacting the engineers is completely at odds with Wayland's plan, and thus they are more a liability than anything. Made worse by the fact that Vickers all but admitted to them there's a hidden agenda at play. Um, Miss Vickers, is there an agenda that you're not telling us about? My company paid a trillion dollars to find this place and to bring you here. Had you raised the monies yourself, Mr. Holloway, we'd happily be pursuing your agenda. Vickers herself just isn't a great choice as director of this mission, since she is desperate for her father's approval and if not that, his death. 
a king has his reign and then he dies. Which doesn't mesh very well with the primary objective, to keep her neglectful father alive forever. But Wayland invited her nonetheless. If she is an android, she's not programmed very well. But there is a secret operative tasked with carrying out Wayland's plan, and this one is definitely an android. David. An extremely unsavory robot with a bigger god complex than his creator. But in terms of the hidden agenda, he plays his part perfectly and killing one of the mission liabilities wasn't exactly a bad thing. These conflicting agendas and lack of information sharing creates a chaotic, disorganized hierarchy which lowers the chance of success dramatically, and thus begins a company trend. I'm genuinely shocked the old prune got a chance to badger his creator at all, and when he did, he still let Shaw come along for the ride. I was wrong. We were so wrong. Despite the fact she just lodged her supreme disapproval at the whole venture, not to mention her presence serves no purpose. Odds are she's only going to get in the way. Wayland then ignores that David essentially just admitted the engineers were on their way to destroy life on Earth and wakes the dude up anyway. Leaving to go where? Earth. Why? Sometimes to create, one must first destroy. So of course, Pete's mission doesn't end the way he'd hoped, with Wayland probably assumed dead. The company goes through its merger with Yutani not long after, which to be honest just seems to have compounded the stupidity. We re-enter the fray with the Covenant, and a bunch of dipshit colonists heading off to ruin a planet called Aurigai 6. These guys do have the excuse that they were never tasked with investigating any alien or goo related mess, but it's safe to say they're not adequately prepared for anything. And again, we can pretty much write them off before they've even set foot on any planet. Led by a disheveled James Franco, who got almost completely cut from the movie. Probably because he couldn't open his eyes long enough to realise he actually wasn't on the set of Pineapple Express 2. This guy is the captain and colony founder, a hippie looking assumed stoner with a free climbing daredevil streak. All apparently great qualities for a man charged with one of the most important and risky missions in human history. He honestly looks better suited to leading a drum circle at Burning Man. Thankfully, the colonists are saved from whatever mess he would have got them all into when he gets blazed one last time, unceremoniously incinerated before we even got a chance to be annoyed with him. But the other command options are almost as bad. Up to bat next, we have a reluctant leader who is not just a moron, but a walking oxymoron. Company didn't trust me to lead this mission because you can't be a person of faith and be counted on to make qualified rational decisions. It's a highly religious chief science officer. Observation, reflection, faith, and determination. In this way, we may navigate the path as it unfolds before us. He's an emotionally unstable wreck, lacking in fundamental leadership skills and basic common sense. Yeah, well, we should do something for Captain Branson. This at least. is not a discussion, Tennessee. This guy is low-key governed by the dangerous notion that God's hand is guiding their path. But his decision to divert from their course and investigate the supposed paradise planet is actually the least of his cock-ups. So after leaving space bound and down in charge of the Covenant, they land on an unknown planet that quite obviously has biological life and just venture straight out there without helmets or hazmat suits on. Great, this again. After succumbing to an inevitable biological outbreak, utter panic ensues. Not having our discipline, typically humans are swept along by the process until it ends. And this time, these idiots actually manage to get an infected person back onto their dropship, which ends as well as you'd expect. Our surviving ground crew then get harassed by a few pasty xenomorph wannabes before dodgy Dave saves the day, leading them to an abandoned city chock full of dead engineers. Is it even safe here? Perfect. Hang on though, since androids are meant to be programmed to give their lives to protect humans, finding this guy as the sole survivor of the Prometheus mission should be ringing alarm bells immediately. Perhaps it has malfunctioned. Meanwhile in orbit, Captain Redneck starts pining for his missus and puts the entire Covenant at risk just to give her a buzz. Mother, bring us to 80 kilometers above the storm, thrusters only comply.
But I really can't blame him for that because all of these active employees are emotionally compromised married couples, which is just a terrible policy to begin with. Back in Engineer City, Captain Christian discovers that David's promise of this place being perfectly safe is patent bullshit. When he witnesses an extremely disturbing family conference between David and one of these pasty morphs, he then takes his smartest course of action yet, putting the creature down swiftly and training the gun straight on David, seemingly recognizing that this android has more than a few screws loose. But this moment of lucidity is passing, because he then agrees to follow David into his house of horrors, which should reaffirm the need to cap this android. But no, let's follow him even deeper down into a dungeon. This looks fine. You are misconstruing the nature of this situation. He then buys into David's bullshit line about things being safe for a second time. Perfectly safe. I assure you. Gives this repulsive alien egg a quick stroke like it's a cuddly kitten. Take a look. And shoves his gob right over it. So much for intelligent design. I'd say the survivors are pretty lucky to be rid of this guy. When one note is off, it eventually destroys the whole symphony. Next up to the plate, it's Captain Bargain Store Ripley. She's smart enough to recognize David's nefariousness after just two minutes in his lair. And she displays a modicum of badassery tangoing with this almost xenomorph. But then she makes perhaps the worst mistake of all. She seems to have some inkling that the surviving android may be David posing as Walter. Yet she doesn't try to test him with any specific knowledge until she is helplessly sealed inside her stasis pod. Walter? When we get there, will you help me build my cabin? Dooming her and all of the colonists to a horrible goo-related death. How she could have deactivated the android even if she wasn't sure, the real Walter would be down with that. Our circumstances seem to require a certain flexibility. So that's another vessel lost to mismanagement, and perhaps not the last one we'll see from this time period. Here comes the hat. I'll do us both. But we need only wait 18 years to find the next hapless mission. It's the Nostromo. At this point, it's not clear what the overall company knew about the Xenomorph or the events of the prequels. But someone appears to have known something because this android plant was placed onto their crew two days before departure and was given Special Order 937, which is an order specifically designed for alien encounters. This suggests the Nostromo was launched with the express purpose of investigating a potentially alien signal at LV-426. That's what Ripley believes and her word is pure canon as far as I'm concerned. How come the company sent us a goddamn robot? All I can think of is they must have wanted the alien for the weapons division. He's been protecting it right along. We can find more evidence in the Colonial Marines technical manual, in which we're privy to a conversation between Wayu employees. They believe that whoever was pulling the strings behind the Nostromo disaster was trying to keep the mission secret so they didn't have to split their bonus share of profits. This hidden exec decided that instead of spending time and energy to organize a proper crew with strict confidentiality agreements, he'd rather send a bunch of unprepared space truckers hoping they were ignorant enough to respond to the supposed distress signal. The only company operative is a creepy android, tasked with working against the crew and protecting the alien. I must caution you both. My tactical analysis does not bode well for the success of such a mission. He succeeds in getting them to investigate the signal and even gets a specimen back on board. But that's precisely when he stops being effective. Ash seems to know that there is something implanted within Kane. Yet after the facehugger stops molesting his face, he just lets Kane wander off to enjoy a casual dinner with friends. I must remind you that it is also a potential security risk. Captain Dallas has so far diverted to Ash in all matters regarding the creature. He could have easily made up some bullshit about possible infection, put Kane in stasis immediately, and that would have been mission accomplished right there. 
How come they're not freezing? But instead, he lets the shit hit the fan. Ripley gets suspicious and checks the Wayland yutani made mother computer, which shows her Ash's top secret orders with a simple command override. Ash manages to subdue Ripley, but then employs the most stupid of all finishing moves. Death by deep throat with a porno mag, possibly emulating his favorite critter. Perfect organism. I find it disturbing. With the android taken out of commission, Ripley is left to sass the xenomorph and float through space for a while. Fast forward 15 years and we re-enter the story in alien isolation. We meet Alan Ripley's daughter, Amanda, who despite having an absentee mother for basically her entire life, obviously still got enough guidance from her mum to become quite the ass kicker herself. It's another important Wayland yutani mission with another poor choice in crew. The company finds out the Nostromo's flight recorder has been found and is currently at Sevastopol Station. They send a pencil pushing lawyer to protect their interests, accompanied by Samuels, an android, who with full clearance given by the company recruits Ripley Jr. seemingly for no other reason than to give her some closure. I've been cleared to offer you a place on the Torrance if you want to come along, maybe there'll be some closure for you. Again, we aren't sure what exactly the wider company knows at this point. The evidence in the technical manual suggests the shadow exec covered up the whole Nostromo incident and never followed up on LV-426 for fear of exposing their activities. But whatever the case, sending Ripley Jr. on this mission seems like a massive conflict of interest and a possible liability if an alternative company agenda comes into play. A few days after the mission launches and before the team has arrived at their destination. Wayland yutani has seemingly found out about the Xenomorphs at Sevastopol and bought the station outright. If this is still a corporate faction pulling the strings, then it must be dudes with some serious clout, rather than sending a message to their team notifying them to abort or standby. The company lets them enter the extremely dangerous situation on Sevastopol to retrieve a flight recorder that has become almost inconsequential and is already trapped on board like everyone else. Nevertheless, I will want to examine it in detail. Wei Yu then sends a special order to the station's Apollo AI, which turns all of the lurking budget androids into murderers, protecting the xenomorphs from human meddling. But the company made a major mistake when they unleashed Ripley Jr. onto the station. And before you assume that Samuels or Taylor are about to activate their real mission, that's where you're wrong. When he's not slaughtering inferior androids, Samuels turns out to be possibly the most achingly nice robot we encounter in the entire franchise. He works against the company at every turn, as his primary programming to protect human life demands. This guy died for you, he's practically a robot Jesus. Yeah, it was definitely a bad idea sending a normal android into this mess. As Marshall Waits suggests, Samuels is about the only person who can actually get through the killer androids and talk with the Apollo AI. Maybe the company should have anticipated all this. It's not clear whether Nina Taylor had any ulterior motive when she arrived. She did have a private message from Marshall Waits, and she seemed interested in finding out everything she could about the Xenomorph and its origins. But if she did have specific orders, she never acted on it. I mean, how could she anyway? She's a noob. So naturally, with a bunch of heroes running around on the station, Wayland yutani again fails to gain any specimens, when their expensive purchase is crushed in the atmosphere of a gas giant. Except for the computer problems, it has been an uneventful day. 42 years later, Ripley Prime gets recovered, and the wider corporations seemingly know nothing of the events of LV-426 or Sevastopol. They've even set up a colony on LV-426 which has lived in peace with a ship full of facehugger eggs for 20 years. Enter Special Projects Director Burke, the epitome of a corporate stooge. Boy's definitely got a corn cob up his ass and one of only a few company faces we can categorically nail to the wall. Right to the wall. 
So after Ripley tells Burke and an assortment of administration dickheads what happened to the Nostromo several times. Looks like a goddamn town meeting. Burke is in such a rush to secure a ship that has been sitting undisturbed for decades. He sends in some poorly prepared colonists to check it out. They're given no knowledge of what they're about to encounter, so inevitably their colony becomes overrun. Why not at least properly brief a colonist or two? They're about to discover the alien you're trying to keep secret anyway. Way. Frankly, I see no logic to your position. Or even better, send a properly trained crew under your direct command. You must be patient and allow yourself sufficient time. You'd think after Ripley's hearing, the corporate board would be all over this shit. The Nostromo being one of the biggest losses in the company's history. So they're either complicit in Burke's activities or simply allowing him to run amok. With the help of the colonial administration, Burke then puts together a markedly better team. We got nukes, we got knives, sharp sticks. Unfortunately, it's filled with people who probably won't take kindly to his hidden agenda. He personally recruits Ripley as a mission advisor, because apparently she knows something about these creatures beyond what she already told everyone. I think it would be best not to bring along someone who obviously has massive beef with the corporation, and is a proven liability to their operations. Why don't you put her in charge? A ring binder could have filled in for this role. They send a whopping crew of 15 to LV-426 aboard the Sulaco, a vessel capable of housing up to 90 active crew members, with a stasis and gear storage capacity that can support up to 2,000 soldiers. It's a small vessel, 15 life forms aboard, low warp capacity, limited armaments, they pose no threat. Technically in charge is Gorman, an extremely green officer who has all of one mission under his belt. So? So what? Not to mention, he simply doesn't command the respect of his team. Shit. Back in the Colonial Marines Technical Manual, it suggested that Burke pulled some strings within the Colonial Administration and intentionally ordered a small detachment and a novice officer in an effort to maintain control over the situation, while stupidly leaving the Colonial Marines in charge of the actual operation. The illusion of control. It's another half-assed clandestine mission utilizing one agent who will basically have to work against and possibly fight everyone else while somehow wrangling a specimen on his own. His resources are extremely limited and the situation on the surface is chaotic. And as is obvious by now, Burke just isn't bright enough to pull this off. Remarkable piece of machinery, completely automated. This team was built on the assumption that these terrifying alien monsters would indeed be found, while ignoring the fact that they'll find it impossible to collect xenomorph specimens because everyone will be dead. There is a very high probability that an away team will sustain heavy casualties. I wouldn't dare say too many negative things about these ultimate badasses. I am the ultimate badass. Yes. Other than they're obviously unprepared for what they're about to encounter, some more than others. This can't be happening, man. This isn't happening. I believe you are having a typically human response to circumstances which are frightening and inexplicable. But the simple fact is, there just isn't enough of them. Overwhelmed, they fall back and hole up for some character development, which gives Burke a chance to ham-fistedly carry out his hidden agenda. I want these specimens destroyed as soon as you're finished with them, is that clear? Mr. Burke gave instructions that they were to be kept alive in stasis for return to the company labs. Ripley uncovers Burke's little scheme and finds his grubby fingerprints all over this Hadley's Hope mess. You were responsible for the deaths of 157 colonists. Wait a sec. You sent them to that ship. It's this exclusive rights thing again. So now if I went and made a major security situation out of it, everybody steps in, administration steps in, and there's no exclusive rights for anybody. Nobody wins. A policy which seems to guarantee a finder's fee or profit percentage to whoever gets the goods. This seems like a strangely outdated policy that is obviously a massive hindrance on overall corporate operations because it creates factional divides and a culture of secrecy and distrust. It's obviously why Wayland yutani execs carry out half-assed clandestine Xeno missions, keeping them secret from other powerful rivals and such. Our best defense is knowledge. 
Back in the technical manual, we see evidence that internal conflict is rife within the company, as different departments compete for an increased share of profits. Burke might as well have fronted his true agenda to the board, and just accepted whatever piece of the pie he could get, because as it is, he's dead meat. Get away from me, man! And if this isn't a policy, but part of the law, you're guaranteed by law to get a share. Then I have no doubt the company would have the power to get it overturned. Speaking of that, why is Burke such a pleb that he's even worried about quarantine? You really think you can get a dangerous organism like that past ICC quarantine? How can they impound it if they don't know about it? What, the almighty company can't get an express queue? Or better yet, divert a ship to pick up the goods. So with all this pressure, and the fact he's going to be outed by Ripley, Burke resorts to some pretty drastic measures. I will give him credit for one thing. I'm genuinely shocked he was able to release these facehuggers without getting a good old fashioned mouth humping himself. Even if he succeeded though, this event would seem damn suspicious. Before the marines can give Burke the hanging he deserves. The coward gets nailed by an alien, almost everyone else dies horribly. Goddess Ripley gives us some legendary wank material. <coughs> and ends up floating through space all over again. Nothing out of the ordinary. But unbeknownst to anyone at all. Burke the cheeky shit managed to fire off a message to his corporate overlords before he bit the dust. Message is transcribed as follows. I don't have a lot of time. The jarheads are checking out the pickup spot. Look, they're gonna nuke the site. I tried to convince them otherwise, but look, you need to send a ship now. Whether this suggests he was working with others, I'm not sure. More likely, it was a prudent measure, sacrificing his profit share simply to survive. And who responds? It's our favorite character. Characters, Michael Bishop, or Michael Wayland, whatever. So Michael redirects the Legato, a corporate colony vessel, to LV-426. Packed full of colonists and conveniently private military contractors. It arrives too late to save Burke or Hadley's hope, but they do find the derelict ship and immediately begin using the hapless colonists as guinea pigs. Not just on the surface, but also on the Legato, their main ticket out of here. That seems a bit risky. That would not be advisable. The corpse soon discovers the location of the Salako and sends the Legato to intercept it. A xenomorph outbreak occurs the moment the two ships dock. Which isn't all that surprising, because the Legato has infected colonists just lying around everywhere, and the PMCs are sanitizing them via flamethrower, which doesn't seem like a very surefire way of killing the chestbursters inside. Have any of you ever seen this creature? So Hicks and co have a quick tango with some PMCs on the Salako, which supposedly causes a stasis pod evacuation we see at the beginning of Alien 3. And this poor sap takes Hicks's place in the death trap like emergency escape vehicle. I'd rather stay on the ship and take my chances with the Xenomorphs. Hicks follows his crush to Furina just in time to watch her die, then gets scooped up by Michael, who for some reason chose to waste his time and risk his personal safety with a Xeno wrangling excursion to Furina, when he already had ample specimens on LV-426. Magic Mike then somehow transports the now infested Salako back into orbit around LV-426. Are we to believe Wayland boarded the ship and brought it back here? Why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. Around this time, it's assumed Mikey does the old switcheroo with his android double and gaps it in the Patna, leaving his psycho robot version to not only confuse us further, but also waste some more time trying to interrogate Hicks for information the company already possesses. I want to talk to you about the events that led us to where we are now. Hicks and a new company comrade eventually do manage to fire off a message, which results in a colonial marine ship, the Sephora, arriving at the scene 17 weeks later. Wayland Dutani, in an attempt to hide their research from the marines, openly attack them from the outset. They even have the audacity to blow up the Sephora. And this isn't some inadequate crew of 15 like on board the Salako. No, there's up to 400 of these badasses on board. It's strange that go to this extreme effort to cover up their crimes. They could have at least tried to swindle their way out of it first. On the surface, we see the full might of the corporation brought down to bear on the derelict site. It's almost impressive. 
almost. The surviving marines manage to fight their way through this origin facility even though it's chock full of Wayland yutani troops. But that's not surprising, because these soldiers seem so woefully trained they announce to their enemies whenever they're advancing or reloading. Even when they're entirely alone. And as with the legato, containment protocols at this facility are more than lacking. As demonstrated by Dr. Butterfingers here, storing live facehugger specimens in highly smashable glass jars. But the security situation is even more dire. This massive complex is surrounded by a solitary ring of electric fences to keep the numerous loose xenomorphs at bay. I'm genuinely shocked this pitiful barrier even stood up against one of them. In an audio log, a foreman requests at least three more layers of electric fence, and notifies his superiors of the mind-bogglingly stupid fact there wasn't even a backup generator. But we don't even have a backup generator. That fence goes down, this entire place is gone in a matter of minutes, you understand? Which is one thing the company seems to have now fixed. Though, it still won't stop a two-man team of soldiers from shutting the fence down completely. With those things running around? You count me out. Yep, it's another woeful, umbrella-esque security system, which leaves their facility extremely exposed when the power goes down. In the ensuing panic, Wayland yutani are forced to quickly wrap things up and escape in their last remaining FTL ship. And luckily, they didn't intentionally infest this one with aliens. But the remaining marines shove their dropship straight in this thing's tailpipe. Five by five and after sassing an alien queen, which for massive beasts are apparently excellent at sneaking onto spaceships. The marines finally get their chance to be confused by Michael Whalen's android. And this guy isn't just a mere body double designed to take a cap for the real Michael. Nope, he's a full on Wayu operative. He's been in command of this facility for a while now and he has an apparent treasure trove of dirt on the corporation. It's already downloading. The best part though, you don't even need to interrogate him to get at it. We got everything. At least a meat puppet would have stayed quiet after they're dead. This android is a gargantuan liability to have hanging around anywhere near your enemies. Fast forward a few centuries, a resurging Wayland yutani mops up another woefully recruited team for another stab at getting them some Xenos. They don't deserve to start again and I'm not going to let them. This time on a planet called New Galveston. It's a novel, Alien Sea of Sorrows. And yes, I read half of it. The company forcibly recruits another full-blown anti wayu rebel, Decker, an apparent descendant of Ripley. He's already been utterly screwed over by the corp for writing an unfavorable report on their activities. And now they're threatening that he's financially liable for the Nostromo and Hadley's hope from a few centuries ago, in some sort of weird quasi-legal blood curse. They're even threatening to go after his children if he doesn't come along for the ride. Apparently his psychic connection with the xenomorphs could be some sort of advantage, but I'd say it's just as likely he could mind control him some drones and sick them on these corporate cronies. Shockingly, the company is now aware of some of the events of LV426. They claim they have never been able to find more specimens anywhere, but did they even try here? This is what the planet looked like the last time we saw it, though some things do seem to have changed within the company by this point. This new team Team is predominantly made up of fully briefed and well prepared soldiers. Amazingly, they actually managed to capture a live drone, temporarily at least, until a typically unprepared Wayu scientist correctly determines that the xenomorphs are too dangerous to be let out and tries to kill everyone by sabotaging the elevator. Once it seems that the remaining team might actually reach the surface, and with two soldiers currently being violated by facehuggers, Rebel Decker does what he was obviously destined to do all along, and tries to put them down. Though this time, our hero fails. What? It's reading right, man, look. Yep, despite another team with some questionable members, Wayland yutani actually won this round. Even the monkeys stood upright at some point. 
But then they allow Decker to just take off as promised, with enough knowledge to write more than a few damning reports about the company. So as we've seen, the corporation isn't exactly great at keeping people on side. Their HR and communications departments absolutely suck if they even exist at all. But their employees and temporary contractors aren't the only people they're messing with. The company's activities are also pissing off a whole bunch of other important players. Point two, Wayland yutani mishandles a range of key stakeholders, threatening the corporation and its interests. First, let's get the obvious out of the way. This megacorp holds a massive monopoly over technology and an obscene amount of political power over this human civilization, without even knowing about the full extent of their crimes. Most decent citizens and smaller businesses alike would naturally have a rather large problem with the existence of Wayland yutani In an alien isolation log, we learn about their business competitors being undercut and their clients siphoned off by Wayland Wayland Utani, which is suggested to be the norm. Wayland Utani and their predecessors tinkering with AI and Android technology is by itself enough to make a lot of people uneasy, not helped along when the company also abuses these technologies by using system AIs to endanger humans and inserting secret Android sleeper agents into teams of unassuming people. As we've seen, these synthetics have the potential to go absolutely insane and can themselves pose a threat to humanity. Even the normal androids hanging around everywhere pose a threat, at least to the company. These later models are apparently not manufactured by Wayu, but still, their meddlesome behavior is just not being accounted for. Unaltered synthetics are said to be part of crews everywhere, and as shown by Samuels, Bishop One, and the Bishop Unit from Colonial Marines, these stock model androids are programmed to assist and protect any and all humans, including our anti-corporate heroes. So naturally, they end up working against the company's most dangerous agenda, the pursuit of the Xenomorph a goal for which the company deservedly gets some serious hate. To acquire specimens, cover up their crimes, and increase profit, the company is willing to alienate and put at risk everyone and everything, including some fairly prominent people who should have been dealt with a bit more tactfully. Let's start with this guy, Henry Marlowe. He's not exactly a saint. He led the salvage crew which found the Nostromo flight recorder, and he even went as far as the derelict on LV-426. This time, his wife was the Darwin Award winner who won a kiss from a facehugger. Why the hell do people keep doing this? The result of some natural evolutionary process. Marlowe then roughhoused his way through station quarantine and is ultimately responsible for the xenomorph mess on Sevastopol. But as soon as this guy gets a whiff of the company sniffing around, he dedicates himself to destroying the entire station in an attempt to kill all the creatures. He could have got a massive company payday by either giving them the information from the Nostromo flight recorder or the location of LV-426, but instead he's chosen to die and take everyone else with him rather than let the company get their hands on the goods. Top man. At the end of Alien 3, Wei Yu just allows prisoner Robert Morse to leave Furina after everything he's seen. This guy is a convicted criminal that society had already forgotten about. His death could have easily easily been part of whatever cover story the company is about to fabricate for the Furina incident, if that's even necessary. But instead, it seems they just put him in another prison somewhere and left him to tell his story. Robert ends up writing a book about his experiences on Furina. I guess the company weren't concerned about the ravings of a convict, but then they legitimize his claims by apparently getting Robert's book banned. Jesus Christ, give us a break! Which I'm sure won't fuel conspiracy theories at all. In Stasis Interrupted, we meet a traitorous Wayland yutani employee, one Dr. Rick. He's a weapons developer assisting in the torture of a colonial marine. So obviously, he's a bit ethically dubious himself. But after bearing witness to Psycho Android Mike's monologue... As for these colonists you seem to be so concerned about, dregs of humanity worthless trash seriously this corporate stooge has the worst bedside manner ever every resource i have is expendable when it comes to ensuring the further study and development drop the weapon of this organism 
Dr. Rick finds this level of depravity a step too far even for him. Which is strange because Wei Yu has already been killing families on the legato. So maybe we got him demoralized. Sure. And he seemingly has no ethical dilemmas about personally murdering a few metric tons of people. Whatever he's in. Next up, it's the United States Colonial Marines, who are traditionally corporate allies. Although the company has some of its tendrils inserted into their administration, the USCM seems fairly independent and serves as one of the main counterpowers to the corp in space. And since, as a military organization, they answer to state powers, it's probably best to keep them happy. But they get completely screwed over by the company in both alien isolation and aliens and things get even worse in Aliens Colonial Marines. The corporation killed over 300 Marines when they destroyed the Sephora. Their actions against the Marines are so extreme. Captain Cruz says he regards the Colonial Marines as being in a state of war with Weyland Utani. I think it's safe to say that the United States Colonial Marines are at war with Weyland Utani over the course of these numerous incidents. If one respected commander managed to fire off a report to HQ, the company could find itself with some formidable opposition by the time they get home. And we're gonna get everything we can to take this company and Michael Whalen down for all the shit they've put us through and taken from us. In fact, Hicks and the surviving Marines should have been able to accomplish this with the intel they jacked. But I guess Hicks didn't make it home this time either. That's depressing. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Though it doesn't matter in the long run, because by the 2290s, the company has seemingly alienated so many stakeholders. They start losing vital government contracts and suffer massive financial losses. Their colony at New Indy are so sick of their shit, they sue the company for independence and they win. This atmosphere of anti-corporate hostility eventually leads to mega corporations being banned completely, but I'm surprised they lasted as long as they did considering the immense danger they posed to humanity over the years. Point 3. Wayland Dutani's futile obsession with capitalizing on the xenomorph puts human civilization at catastrophic risk. They've also missed opportunities that would have increased their chances of covertly acquiring specimens. Wayland Utani's obsession with the Xenomorph is driven by their desire to develop technology and weaponry, if not weaponize the creature itself. But in the Wayland Utani report, even the company acknowledges how dangerous the creature is, and that every encounter with the Xenomorphs has ended in bloodshed. This species poses a massive existential threat to humanity and all complex life for that matter. Despite this, on two different occasions, company operatives attempted to bring live specimens near Earth. Even if they did manage to smuggle back a few aliens, there may simply be no way to control the species for any meaningful length of time. These are issues that are acknowledged by many different characters throughout the series, even by the company's own employees. The potential profit may be massive, but it's also a massive gamble, and they stand to lose everything they've already gained should they fail to maintain control. Can't allow it to live. Everything we know would be in jeopardy. Who is humanity fighting that there's even a huge market for weaponry? Are your people at war? We don't hear about any large-scale wars throughout the series. The company claims in the Wayland yutani report that their obsession is not just about profit, but also about continuing to advance humanity. Yet they fail to recognize that the Xenomorph itself is the greatest threat to humanity and therefore the company. If anything, they should be dedicating themselves entirely to wiping these creatures from the galaxy. It needs to be done. And creating weaponry to do just that. We got sonic, electronic, ball breakers. Study some dead specimens if you have to. That's seriously the only safe option there is. But since they are so dedicated to their risky enterprise of capturing xenomorphs, what instead could they do to increase their chances of actually acquiring specimens while also keeping things hush hush and not directly endangering human life? How? Androids and dogs. Just hear me out. Good idea. 
they could send teams of partially reprogrammed androids on xenomorph wrangling missions, tweaked just enough so they don't realize that their work might end up endangering humans. Bishop was practically a saint, but even he didn't have a problem with shipping out some live facehuggers for Burke, and the company managed to reprogram Ash to straight up try to kill people for the sake of acquiring specimens, slightly adjusting their ethical parameters should be an easy coding job, with no triggering humans to get in the way. Synthetics are better placed than anyone else for extracting and studying live specimens. There is some evidence that xenomorphs do not immediately recognize an android as a threat. In Alien Resurrection, Annalee Cole survived a dip in xeno-infested waters. On Sevastopol Station, most of the working Joe synthetics weren't bothered by the aliens at all. David seemed to be able to hang around some precursory overmorph eggs for quite some time, without getting mouth molested. And finally, in the novelization of Aliens, Bishop is attacked by a xenomorph, but after freezing completely, the creature seems to lose interest. He speculates that as long as it doesn't pose a threat, an android will be viewed as a piece of machinery. It's possible androids might be able to sneak off a few eggs before any lurking drones would even notice. The analytical nature of androids also makes them great scientists. They don't need sleep, and they have superior fine motor skills, which will hopefully avoid those worrisome jar smashing incidents. I feel safer already. And even if things get out of hand, androids deny the xenomorph the chance to propagate and spread, as long as the live specimens are kept away from the core worlds. Extraction and research could be conducted a lot more safely. And if you do need to hatch a few chestbursters, just take along some dogs, cows, or even apes. If they were lucky enough to survive this corporatocracy, that is. Sure, they'll still be bastards, but they'll be bastards more likely to accomplish their goals and less likely to wipe out humanity. Where that new course leads is up to you. And then, when the job is done, just decommission the androids and destroy the evidence. Kill you! Does that compute? It should be a fairly easy cover up, with full share of profits and with no rebellious humans around to tell the tale. No pictures. But at the most recent point in the timeline, the existence of the Wayland Utani report suggests that the new incarnation of the company has improved their methodology. They now seem committed to consolidating their Xeno intel, admitting their past errors, and approving clearance for a wider group within the corporation. And as we learnt in Sea of Sorrows, a marginally more competent human crew even succeeded with the corporation's long sought after goal. Though, since they were just flying away with a few harmless, impregnated humans, I'd wager if there were just one more chapter, the xenomorph chaos would no doubt resume. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for an acid resistant mouth shield. And don't forget to use flame units only to blast that like button.